I think the greatest sin in the world is bringing children into the world that have disease from their parents, that have no chance in the world to be a human being, practically. Delinquents, prisoners, all sorts of things just mark when they're born. That, to me, is the greatest sin. The unborn is a living, distinct, whole human being. Pro-lifers are not saying abortion is wrong because they dislike it. They're saying it's wrong because it intentionally kills an innocent human being. It's about what's right and wrong in spite of our taste, not what's right and wrong according to our taste. I need to tell everyone in this room that abortion is a murder. Cry out to the Lord, Lord, Forgive me. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. What you're about to hear are the sounds of metal BBs striking the side of a tin can. For every BB that strikes, it represents 10,000 lives lost in the wars of America's past. The American Revolution. the Civil War, World War One, World War II, the Korean conflict, the conflict in Vietnam, September 11th and the War on Terror. Since 1973, the war of the unborn child. God help us. Hello, my name is Scott Klusendorf. Welcome to Life is Best. Answering one question, what is it? I don't consider it a human being. Yes, it's another human life, but it's their body. It's not exactly something, but then again, it, it is something. It's kind of more like a bunch of cells. To me, they're not alive, so like, I'm okay with that. The child is not technically alive. You should have the right to end the child's life if, 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 if it needs to be. It's only a potential human being. Abortion kills a potential human being. Abortion is best defined as the intentional killing of a human fetus. And that's just not my perspective. That's what a lot of abortion choice advocates will say, or at least the more honest ones. For example, feminist Naomi Wolf calls abortion a real death. Now it's true, some feminists like Kath and Pollitt say it's no different than vacuuming out your house. But those that are honest will admit that abortion definitely kills something that's alive. And not only does abortion kill that something, it intentionally kills that something. So when we talk about what is abortion, we're not talking about killing in general, we're talking about the intentional killing of an innocent human being. I need to, with all the boldness that the Holy Spirit will grant to me, tell everyone in this room that abortion is a murder. It is the murder of a human being. I'm gonna have to say it, I'm gonna show it to you in the Word, I wanna prove it to you with science, I wanna just lay it before you and say abortion is murder. 
and, it, and it's a holocaust like the world has yet to see. In fact, just to put it in perspective, Stalin was guilty of murdering 40 million of his own countrymen, Hitler, 30 million human beings, and the United States, since Roe versus Wade, not globally, but the United States, has blown past both of those brothers and have made them look angelic as we have slaughtered wholesale 55 million little boys and little girls. Millions of little boys and little girls. That is why this show has a threefold purpose. One, save lives. Two, save souls through the preaching of the healing power of the gospel. And three, equip believers to make a persuasive case for life. This is a matter of life and death. This is not a preference issue. What do we mean when we say something is wrong? For example, if I said to you, chocolate ice cream is better than vanilla, you would right away recognize that's a statement about me. It's subjective to me. You might like vanilla, or you might like strawberry. You would think it real odd if I said to you, chocolate is morally superior to vanilla. You would rightly think that guy's nuts. But what if I said the following? It's wrong to torture toddlers for fun. Now I'm no longer talking about what I like or prefer. I'm talking about what's right or wrong, regardless of my likes or dislikes. People think that when you claim abortion is wrong, you're saying you dislike it. But pro-lifers are not saying abortion is wrong because they dislike it. They're saying it's wrong because it intentionally kills an innocent human being. It's about what's right and wrong in spite of our tastes, not what's right and wrong according to our tastes. And that's the key point that people get so wrong. Imagine if I said to you, don't like slavery, don't own a slave. Or, don't like spousal abuse, don't beat your wife. In both cases, you would understand that I did not really grasp what was at stake with slavery and wife beating. That I was treating slavery and wife beating as mere preferences like ice cream. So when pro-lifers say abortion is wrong, they're not talking about their preferences, they're talking about what's right and wrong in spite of likes and dislikes. Pro-choicers are right. We should trust women to make their own personal decisions. We should keep government out of their private business. We should keep laws away from them that restrict their freedoms. I agree with pro-choicers completely if. If what? If the unborn are not human. If morally speaking, abortion is no different than clipping a fingernail, I see no reason to oppose it whatsoever. But if abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being, we have a problem. The idea that life begins at conception is a scientific fact. Like here we are, everyone in this room, we had a beginning, and, and that beginning, every one of us, was when a sperm and an egg collided, and in that collision, a new strand of DNA was born that was wholly separate from mom's DNA, wholly separate from dad's DNA, like right out of the gate, there, there we are, um, in the image of God, made in the womb, life begins at conception. And, and what I love about Psalm 139 is it shows the activity of God in our personhood, shaping who we would be, not when our conscience finally turns on, not when we're three years old and we're like, okay, this is right, this is wrong. No, no, no. In the womb, shaping, molding, weaving, putting together. And if I understand this passage right, we see that God is putting together our unformed substance and he is putting together our frame. The way I've always interpreted this is, is God in his sovereign reign, knowing the days that he's going to form for us is actively involved in mom's womb, putting together according to his will and his good pleasure, the, the frame and unformed substance, our personality, our makeup, uh, how we're gonna interact and react. He's putting it all together because he's building out these days in which we will invade. The Bible teaches that all humans have value because they bear the image of God. The science of embryology teaches us that from the earliest stages of development, the unborn are distinct, living, and whole human beings. That is why this is a matter of life and death. Prepare to save lives, save souls, and defend human life. The 
the unborn is a living, distinct, whole human being. I'm glad my mother did not go to Hillary Clinton for prenatal counseling. Imagine criminals invading the womb of the mother. Abortion is murder. Prepare to save lives, save souls, and defend human life. Welcome back to Life is Best. Some would say the abortion issue is complex, that it's about choice, privacy, trusting women, rape and incest, life of the mother. But in reality, it's not complex. It inevitably comes down to one question. What is it? Before we can answer the question, can we kill the unborn? We have to answer the question, what is the unborn? That's the question at the center of the whole debate. If having an abortion is no different than clipping my fingernail or pulling my tooth, then I don't have a problem with it. But if abortion takes the life of a human being, that's a different matter altogether. So we've got to start with that question, what is the unborn? Do you think abortion is complex or simple to figure out? Um, I think it's pretty complex. What makes it complex for you? Because it depends on the person's situation. Like, some people just aren't ready or don't have the ability or the resources to raise a child, mm -hmm. and abortion is the only way to go. The science of embryology tells me without a doubt that from the very beginning, that is conception, the unborn is a living, distinct, whole human being. Scientifically, we know that the unborn are alive. They fit the definition of what an organism is. They undergo cellular reproduction, meaning they grow, they metabolize by turning food into energy. They respond to stimuli. The unborn is distinct. That is, it is a separate entity from its mother. It is not part of her body. The unborn has its own unique genetic code. It's different from moms and dads. That's why you hear people argue um, in ways to say, the unborn has its own gender. It has its own blood type. Yes, all of these things are true because the unborn is distinct. What are the unborn? Are they human of value like you and I? Are they the same as us? Or are they different in morally important ways that allows us to do the things that we're doing to them to the practice of abortion? What they are is so important. We can demonstrate it to you by a very simple anecdote that I offer. Imagine you go into your Home Depot, your local Home Depot. There's a section there in the garden section, in the home and garden section, that has uh, insecticides and dealing with pests in the garden. And you look at that and almost nobody has any problem with that. How to kill ants, how to kill wasps, how to kill all these different animals. You don't see people morally struggling in the pesticide section of Home Depot. But what if right next to it was a section that was to kill your neighbor's dogs and cats section? Well, that would probably be a little bit more moral troubling. You would see that section and immediately realize something's wrong with Home Depot. Why are we killing our neighbor's cats and dogs? Why has this become an issue? And if next to that was kill your neighbor's section, well, then you would have a deeply morally troubling issue going on at Home Depot. You would suddenly be in the middle of a section that was designed to kill your neighbors, other human beings. You would immediately know that something was wrong with that. You don't need a PhD to tell you that human life is more valuable than the life of the ants that you buy bait traps for. You don't need a college professor to say that. You know that full well with your moral intuitions. And you can trust those to give us basic information about what we do and don't know as we're talking about the value of human life. Human life simply does have more value. And so when we ask the question, what are the unborn? We have to determine whether they're more like you and me, valuable human life that we recognize that it's wrong to do certain things to, or whether they're more like those ants or those bugs, or those things that in Home Depot that we see no problem and having a whole section devoted to killing them. Unlike my skin cells or just any old cell that I could uh, scratch my skin cells and they would fall off of my body and die very shortly after they hit the ground. I have not just killed an organism. Those cells are a part of me. They contribute to the overall function of the organism that is me. An embryo is different in kind from just any old cell. It is a whole entity in and of itself, and its parts contribute to its overall function even at that single-celled stage. Another way to think about the idea that the unborn is whole is to understand that in our society, we get really confused between something that is constructed versus something that is developed. We think of constructed things often because we live in an industrial society and we build a lot of things. 
Uh, just like my car is put together on an assembly line, or my son puts together uh, Legos in a castle, and he puts together those Legos one by one until he has what he wants to build as the finished product. Unlike a constructed thing, which is nothing more than a sum of its parts put together piece by piece, the unborn does something that no constructed thing could ever do. It develops itself from within. That means that you didn't come from an embryo, you once were an embryo, and everything that makes you you was already there at that first stage of your development. If a mother had a two-year-old and she wasn't ready to raise him, and she didn't want to give him up for adoption, would it be okay for her to kill the two-year-old? No, but I, it's not the same thing. So would the issue be then not that whether or not the mother's ready or not, but whether the unborn is human like that toddler? Mm. I have to go with the latter, yeah. Okay, so if the unborn were human like that toddler, then the mother being ready or not would not be a good reason for killing the toddler? Is that what you're saying? Okay. Notice something about that conversation. The issue of abortion was complex to that student only so long as she was allowed to believe the unborn weren't human. She hadn't argued for it, she was simply assuming the unborn weren't human. And what I did in that conversation is force her to look at the question, what is the unborn? As Christians, we know biblically, scientifically, and intuitively that the unborn are distinct, living, and whole human beings. That is why we've always got to direct this conversation back to the question, what is it? There's a Planned Parenthood brochure from 1961 that says abortion kills the life of a baby after it's begun and is dangerous to your life and health. I'm going to go on down and ask the director of the Planned Parenthood clinic here if she'd be willing to hear that quote and comment on it. I'm not sure she knows where it comes from. I struck out. I asked three times if there was someone inside that clinic that could talk to me. I asked if I could talk to the director. No. I asked if there was a press person I could talk to. No. I asked if there was a time I could come back. No. Would you want to comment, though, if you had a brochure that said this? An abortion requires an operation. It kills the life of a baby after it has begun. It is dangerous to your life and health. Needless to say, they don't have any of those brochures laying around Planned Parenthood waiting rooms anymore. And who can blame them? The science is clear. The unborn are distinct, living, whole human beings. The Bible is clear. Humans bear the image of God. And if we're honest, our intuitions are clear. We know what we're killing. We're killing a human being. When we come back on Life is Best, we're going to give you a tool for demonstrating that there's no essential difference between killing that child in the womb and killing you. Turn on the evening news, if you dare, and you'll notice the world is in sorry shape. War, divorce, violence, and immorality. The thought of preaching the gospel to this sin-sick world is nothing short of terrifying. If you're like most of us, you'd rather not confront the darkness. That's why Wretched produces DVDs like Terrified 2 and Wretched Radio and Wretched TV. Wretched. Amazing grace. Amazing gospel. Welcome back. Sometimes when you're discussing human value, let's face it, things can get really confusing. People will give you a phone book list of reasons about why the unborn don't count. They'll tell you the unborn are too small, or they're not self-aware, or they can't feel what we feel, or they can't interact with their environment. 
When people bring these objections up, we have an acronym for you that will help you slot their objections into that acronym known as SLED to help you respond persuasively. When these objections come up, get on your SLED and stay on it. Size, level of development, environment, and degree of dependency. If we just look at size for a second, we can see, does size really determine your value? The argument might go something like this, the embryo is tiny, therefore insignificant. But if size is what determines our value, we're in big trouble. Look around you, everyone is different sizes. If the embryo is tiny and doesn't matter, logic demands that we're consistent across the board and say that smaller human beings have less value than larger ones. And that just doesn't make any sense. There's no grounding for human equality there. Intrinsic value is the only answer that makes sense at the end of the day. Megan is making a very important point. Body size does not equal value. We don't think it's less a crime to beat a two-year-old who's smaller than a five-year-old. We don't think that a seven foot two basketball star has more value than all of us simply because he's larger. As a matter of principle, as soon as you say body size is what gives us our value, you have to follow through and say large people have more rights than small people. But we know better than that. We know that can't be right. Now when you hear people say this, when they bring up something like size, it's also important you listen for the next thing you know they're gonna bring up which is the L. Level of development. The unborn are less developed than we are, therefore less deserving of a right to life. My daughter Neely is eight and a half years old. She's about to be nine, and she doesn't yet have a fully working reproductive system. She hasn't developed it yet. But can I kill her because she's less developed than me? No way, that makes no sense. But if you're gonna grant it here, logic says, you gotta grant it down the road as well. Be listening for the level of development argument. It will come up. People will bring up self-consciousness. The unborn don't count because they don't feel like we do, can't process things like we do, don't interact with their environments the way that we do. When you hear these things come up, it's best to personalize it so you can shift from the abstract to the concrete. That's precisely what Megan did. She didn't just talk about these concepts as some kind of abstract thing out there. She brought it right home to her own daughter, Neely. And she made the point that if development defines humanity, her daughter loses. That was a powerful point. Abraham Lincoln did the same thing with slavery. He pointed out that if you claim that we're human and valuable because our skin is fairer than the black man, well, guess what? The first person you meet with skin fairer than your own can enslave you. Don't fall for this level of development argument. It results in savage inequality. Environment, that is where you're located, what does that have to do with what you are? You don't roll over in bed at night and become somebody new. In fact, you could fly to the moon and you would still be you. And there are great arguments as to why that is the case. But what it does tell us is that an eight to nine inch journey down the birth canal doesn't make a non-valuable, non-human entity into a valuable human entity just like that. If that's true, logic says, be careful if you move to a new address. When people bring up environment, they're trying to convince you that the child's location is decisive, that somehow moving from inside the womb to outside the womb determines whether you have a right to life. But why would we believe that a simple change of location fundamentally changes who you are? Watch this. I just changed location. I moved a step to the left. I didn't stop being me. If that's true, the child's location, moving from inside the womb to outside the womb, can't fundamentally change who he is. If he wasn't already human, he's not going to get there just by moving down the birth canal. When people bring up this whole idea of environment, what they're really trying to convince you is that somehow changing location changes you. And degree of dependency. The unborn are dependent on their mothers for survival, and so they don't have a right to life, the argument goes. My mom is diabetic. She is dependent upon her medicine to survive. Without it, she can't process sugars on her own, and her body won't be able to do that. She might die. I can't kill her because of her dependency. But logic says, if you're gonna grant it here, you've gotta grant it down the road as well. 
And these types of instrumental value answers create spectrums of value because all of these types of things come in degrees between different human beings. Intrinsic value is the only answer that makes sense at the end of the day. The science of embryology shows us that from the earliest stages of development, in other words, when you were at the two cell stage, you were a distinct living and whole human being. You didn't come from an embryo, you once were one. There's no essential difference between that embryo you once were and the young adult you are today that would justify killing you back then. You're larger, but body size doesn't give you value. You're more developed, but we don't think two-year-olds that aren't as developed as 20-year-olds have less of a right to life. You're in a different environment. You're out of the womb, you were once in. But I would argue where you are has no bearing on who you are. When you left home this morning and came to class, you didn't stop being you. Mm -hmm. And finally, degree of dependency. Sure, you depended on the mother for survival, your mother in your case, but dependency on another human being is not a good reason for saying we can kill you. Let me ask you a question. Are you starting to see that these arguments are persuasive? And maybe they're so persuasive that you're starting to feel a tinge of guilt over a past decision you made to have an abortion? And maybe you're thinking, hey, I didn't have this information before, and I acted in a way I wouldn't have acted if I had known what I'd seen today. You may be a guy who thinks, man, I drove a girl to a clinic, or a woman who made that decision because you thought you had no other way out. If that's you and you're feeling the guilt of a past abortion decision, I have very good news for you. What must you do to be saved? You must recognize that you can not save yourself. No one can do that, but that's what God has done through His Son, Jesus Christ. What must you do? You must acknowledge that you have sinned, not just with regard to the abortion, but with regard to everything, like all of us. And you must turn and receive the free gift of eternal life that was won for you on Calvary. Cry out to the Lord, Lord, forgive me. Lord, save me. Lord, I believe in thee. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And that is our prayer for you. Thank you for watching Life is Best.